Hello. Hey, Ryan, you're early. I know it's a miracle. So I don't know how it happened. <laughs> well, I do know how it happened. Marin decided to quit sleeping. So. Oh, uh, that's great. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. How's everyone? You ready for break, Ryan? I'm ready for break. Yeah. I'm like so behind in grading. I'm like kind of embarrassed. And like at this point, there's just nothing to do but wait for break to grade. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I I'm often really uptight about getting grades back and the students are like, it, it's like, it matters, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. They want to see that they got a grade. They don't actually look at your feedback and yet. They I don't, don't, know. That's how but I then feel. like I, I, so I give exams on Friday and I return them the next Monday and that is my rule. And it's just, it's a really a pain in the butt, but that's just my rule. It's a good rule. And, and then they're like, I think we got good feedback on time. You know, <laughs> like I busted my ass, right? They it like they don't even notice. Or if they do, they don't they don't comment. So I'm like, I don't know. Who knows what students like? They're they're kind of, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm not going for teacher of the year this year, I guess. So it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> what? Have you have you been going for teacher of the year? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Hey Stacy, how are you? Here, almost here. <laughs> almost here. Hi. You should be able good to morning. share if you want to, Kartik. Hi, good to see you. Good to see good everybody. So what we're going to see today is not Kartik's well-being work. It's something different and something that I think you've been working on and kind of hinting at, right? But mm -hmm. we have not seen it. And what we're see what I'm seeing on my screen Kartik is the kind of the presentation mode where we see what your next slide is. Yeah, there we go. All right. Okay. So we, yeah, we can... I draw or okay, no. Um, we can wait a couple minutes yeah, to sure. see who else shows up. I I don't remember who's who's slated to be here. It'll be recorded anyway. Um maybe a a quick was trying to think of a quick getting to know you that wouldn't take too much time away. Uh, and we haven't done it in a while, but then I'm all, I'm often not wanting to take time away, but then there's that, there's that trade-off. So maybe look around you and one thing that say one thing that you notice that you would like to open yourself to appreciating today, right now. So, um, Naomi, you can start, and Kartik, I'll make you next, and then I'll put an order in the chat. Kristen, Ellison, after that. Um, okay. <laughs> 
I'm thinking what I've been trying to appreciate more is um, I think my food, just like generally realizing how much time and energy went in for both by the the plant, right? The amount of time and energy it took for it to grow and then the time and energy that it took to plant it and harvest it and then bring it over to to Fort Collins where I can eat it. Um, because I notice I'm not very, like, I just kind of eat stuff pretty quickly without thinking too much. And I think it kind of causes a bit of a disconnect between me and the sustenance. Um, and so I'm trying to trying to cultivate that a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, I right, just took a picture of what I see outside. This is the view I have sitting right here. So there's a couple of squirrels playing around. So I think I usually don't find the time to just sit down and look at them. I usually just, I'm working, I just see them running. So I do want to take some time just to sit here and close my computer and just look outside. So that's something that I don't do yeah. much often, but I would want to appreciate that view a little more. So. Um, I would say I'm in my office and I repainted recently. So just being being home and being here to enjoy it. Um, the, the nice window because it's it's not looking out to the train every day. <laughs> so um let's see. I I appreciate having coffee in the morning. Yeah, uh, I, I was catching up with my school friends last night and I, I feel that I really appreciate them being in my life and hope to have more frequent communication with them. I mean, I'm in my office, so nothing around here is that exciting, but I'm legitimately excited to hear Kartik present on heat pump subsidies, so <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> For me, I appreciate the calm environment here in Fort Collins, far away from rush hours of big cities. I really enjoy here. Mm -hmm. I um, am traveling and I just arrived at a room. I'm getting through Airbnb in a house and it's a little attic room. It has four of those windows that are slanted and i love those windows and i'm just gonna look at them all weekend mm -hmm. i love attic rooms I, I would like spend my life traveling between little funky attic rooms if i could Neat. um i'm in my home office which has a closet in it and on one of the closet shelves I can see in a box that I have a bunch of Shabbos candles and what I appreciate is that it's Friday and that it is Shabbat and I haven't observed Shabbat in a really long time but it feels like a really good time to start taking back up some ritual practices to get centered and to um, connect with others. Thank you, Stacy. You have made me hungry for challah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kartik, you are can take it away unless you want to give a yeah. Do do what you will. This is sure. all yours. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So for today, I think it, for the first time, I don't have any results, or maybe I have one result that I'll show towards the end. But I want this to be more of yeah, a motivation sort of discussion for the paper. So if you have any thoughts, comments, anything that I should be doing differently. So what I'll do is I'll go through how I got into this, what my learnings are, how did we set up the problem, how did we set up the paper, and then maybe next week or later, whenever I'll discuss more of you know what we are finding. But today, I'll just give you a more background sort of story of you know, where I am and what I'm doing with this. 
so yeah this paper actually might not exist soon because if they get rid of the justice 40 initiative which was the executive order by the current administration then we don't have to talk about this but till then yeah we're looking at how do you balance efficiency and justice trade-offs in this policy we'll go through the policy uh, how it's defined and what are the challenges with the definition and the implementation of this policy and we're using heat pump adoption and heat pump subsidies as a case scenario for how you would implement this policy so we have pretty simple rules for the heat pump adoption itself but yeah i'll get into that so please just also stop me if you have anything to add or any clarifications so, okay, what is the Justice 40 initiative? And there's a screening tool associated with associated with it, which is the CEJST tool, so the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. And yeah, this is the prompt or this is the declaration made, uh, which says that 40% of overall federal benefits, so have to go to disadvantaged communities. So any federal investment, 40% of the benefits need to go uh, towards disadvantaged communities. And then we'll talk about sort of the keywords in this discussion. So what does investment mean? What does benefit mean? What does disadvantaged mean? And you know, 40%. So as it stands, there's about seven broad areas in which this is being implemented. So you have climate change, energy, transportation, housing, uh, pollution, water, and uh, employment workforce. And in theory, every federal agency is supposed to abide by this and try to implement uh, this in their policies. And as it stands, there are about 518 different programs that are already doing this and the DOE is the one that has the highest representation with about 165 programs in DOE trying to implement this and we'll see how they're trying or how we think they should be trying. And also if you have something in the chat, I cannot see the chat, so please just, just say it aloud. Okay, so the first question is, yeah, what does being disadvantaged mean according to the tool and what they have is for each of the seven areas they have more sort of subsections and each of them there is a certain definition so for example for energy the definition is that you need to be at or above the 90th percentile for energy spending or the 90th percentile for PM 2.5 in the air, and there's a certain income cutoff as well. And all these percentiles are from, they're not the household level distribution, but they are the track level distribution. So in the US, it's about 70,000 census tracts, and then each census tract is assigned an energy cost of PM 2.5 and an income uh, median income level, and then these are the percentiles coming from the tract distribution and not the household distribution. So that's already a, a, a jump going from household to the, the tract level. And then you similarly, you have you know, different ways for defining how you would be considered disadvantaged across these uh, different dimensions. Karchik, for the energy one, is that 90th percentile cost as a, fun, as a percentage of your income, like energy right. burden? It's it's uh, not. It's not if you have a giant house, poor you, right? No, no. So it's the median okay. energy cost for the tract. But it isn't... Energy burden, energy burden, median energy burden. So it's a sum median of energy, okay. energy Thank you. burdens divided by your income. Yeah. and this is the tool that they have so this is already live and this is an example just looking at energy burdens uh like this is for the new york area you can go around play and see you know where are these tracks located so it's just an example of what it actually looks like 
And the question is, yeah, what, so that is disadvantaged across different buckets or different areas. And a community is considered as a DAC if it meets more than one threshold. So it ha you have to be both energy plus something else to be considered as a DAC in the current definition. Or if your area is surrounded by DACs, then you would also be considered a DAC. And as we saw, the definition is for census tract. So you are already losing resolution when it comes to that. And you're also losing out people who might be disadvantaged, but then living in different, different tracks. So you're not really capturing that heterogeneity because of your aggregation bias. But even using just this definition, these are on the right, you see this figure, which is percentage of population that is classified as disadvantaged using this definition. And you see that even at the national level, this about 32, 33% of the population is considered disadvantaged. And then you have a lot of uh, states in the South, which have alarmingly high number of population who are who would be considered disadvantaged under this definition. So I think Oklahoma is the highest from, from this one. And then you see all the other states down there. So the next question is how does, how do federal investments work? So you've identified certain tracts as being disadvantaged. Now, how do you ensure that 40% of the benefits go to these communities? And this was sort of a learning experience for me, just trying to figure out how federal investments work. So there's three different kinds. So you have block grants, you have categorical grants, and then you have direct uh, assistance. So block grants are grants where money is given to certain state and local governments without much restriction on how the money should be used other than showing that, well, it's going to benefit low and moderate, moderate income people, but there's no specific way in which, how, in which states and local governments can use this money. And the challenge with these type of grants is that you have no control on who's applying for these grants. And usually it tends to be that the people you want the disadvantaged communities that you want to serve, they usually don't end up applying for such grants for various reasons. So that is one of the big reasons why state, why federal investments are not able to get this 40% number with these block grants and also the categorical grants, which is the next type, because people are not applying for a whole bunch of reasons, either the application form is long, they don't know about it. There's a lot of reasons why people don't want to apply for these grants. So categorical grants are similar to block grants, but they're more narrowly defined in their scope. So some of the popular programs that you might be aware of, such as the LIHE program or the weatherization programs fall under this criteria. And states have uh, different income and local uh, area cutoffs for how you would qualify to get these grants. And it's usually, you know, about 200% the federal poverty line or it's some relative number to the poverty threshold. So in theory, this is not too bad because it is people who are low income who end up applying for these grants. So it's not directly implementing the 40% uh, investment and benefits criteria, but it's perhaps not as bad as the block grants. And then finally, you have uh, the direct financial assistance where you can get direct assistance from the federal government and you don't have to go through the states or the local, um, uh, local agencies to uh, get help. And a lot of the USDA uh, programs fall uh, under this criteria. So that's about how investments are usually done uh, at the federal level. The states and local have their own thing. We're not talking about that here. 
So what are some of the challenges associated with this program? The first one, as we saw, is the definition of disadvantaged. So we saw that energy, for example, has uh, the expenditure burden and it is done at the track level and it's not done at the household level. And more importantly, across not just energy, but all the different dimensions, there is no inclusion of race for, well, mostly political reasons. And there's a lot of push from academia, at least, to include race into these uh, tools somehow, but we don't think that it's gonna happen anytime soon, but that is something at least from an analytical point of view, we should be looking at. So how do we include race into this discussion of being disadvantaged? And the second one is this reliance on primarily on track level data as it stands in the tool. And you are missing out a lot on the underlying heterogeneity within the track. And most of this is due to data, the well, lack of data. And, and the third and the most interesting one is, well, how do you define benefits? So the policy statement itself says that you need 40% of the benefits to go to disadvantaged communities. And there's already recognition that these benefits can be both well, direct and indirect. So this could be just that you spend 40% of your investment or your grant money in these communities and that's how you justify uh, sticking to this number or you could also think about other benefits or co-benefits that come from the health or emissions reduction or creation of new jobs or it could also be indirect benefits coming in terms of pollution reduction that happens in faraway locations because you've changed uh, a certain technology uh, in another location so this is where a lot of interesting analysis can be done trying to measure where the money is going and what are the benefits that you're generating uh, from the money that you've put in. And so this is a fairly recent policy brief. So the policy brief was given out in was it 2020, 2021. And there's been a few works trying to analyze this. So I'll just talk about three different examples here. Uh, so I've seen some work, this is, uh, two, three papers looking at EV charging infrastructure and how this would be implemented uh, using this policy. And the challenge here is that, but it's usually richer people and the more advantaged communities who have electric vehicles. And if the policy brief says that your charging infrastructure needs to be, you know, 40% of that needs to go to disadvantaged communities who generally don't have EVs compared to other people, then there is this trade-off between equity and utility that arises. And there's a couple of papers discussing, you know, how should you do it and what else can be done to bridge the gap of EV adoption and the charging infrastructure. Another discussion that's been happening is that of critical minerals and how usually communities around mining areas are more affected by these uh, mineral extraction, but then you can justify mineral extraction, let's say lithium or cobalt, because well, you're going towards renewables and that's going to create more jobs and all of that in another part of the country or the world. So how do you balance issues where advantage for along one dimension can be viewed as disadvantage along another dimension? So there's also a few papers in that area. And then finally, the third one, which is the figure shown also here, is very interesting looking at scenarios of PM 2.5 exposure under business as usual and different uh, justice 40 scenarios. Here, this is really interesting because what they're claiming is that if you look at the panel on the top, which is the absolute disparity in PM 2.5 across different communities. So the orange one is where we are right now and then nothing changes in 20 years. And then you have these three different scenarios. 
and the absolute disparities are going to decrease. So you're going to have lesser PM2.5 exposure overall if you follow these, uh, the 40% Justice 40 initiative uh, guideline. But what's more interesting is the figure below, which is the relative disparity in exposure. So although the absolute numbers go down and everybody is facing less, but relative to the average, you still have people of color, uh, for example, still facing higher levels of PM 2.5 exposure, even under this uh, new way of thinking about investments and benefits. So this again, wish to the argument here in this paper was, well, how do we ensure that the relative disparities are also sort of flattened and we are not perpetuating or propagating what is already existing where we know that uh, communities of color face uh, higher levels of pollution already. So how do you make sure that we don't still continue on the same trajectory? So yeah, that's some of the interesting work that's been happening in this area already. Can you take a minute to walk? I, I don't understand these graphs or how to interpret them. Yeah, so sure. I understand mm -hmm. business as usual, but I don't understand the, like, I don't understand how um, you can see what the effect of Justice 40 might be, for example. So there's two different Justice 40 conditions. So the light blue and mm -hmm. the dark blue. Mm -hmm. But what are they? This more aggressive uh, reductions in PM 2.5. And then what should, it, oh, and then the the fact that the relative disparity is increasing slightly is, a, mm -hmm. that's is an issue, is that. that's the issue. Correct. Because my, yeah, so that's interesting because my feeling is not, is there still disparity, but would there be more disparity without the policy, right? Because we know there's disparity, mm -hmm. we're trying to reduce it. So we should be looking at the difference. And this is showing that the policy introduces more disparity. I don't know mm -hmm. why that would be. Correct, the policy is introducing more disparity. Yeah, I don't know why exactly as in, it is possible that reduction in one area is, increasing it or whether it is just the the track averages are hiding the heterogeneity within the track because pm 2.5 measurements i think they have higher resolution so they can go within a track and actually track in a square kilometer or something who's getting how much as opposed to a, a census track average so maybe that they're capturing that heterogeneity that is missing isn't it just because it's relative? Also that, well, yes, it is relative. But then so, relatives increase though. Well, I think this is like the the this is the academic argument for why we need to think about race is the way I think of it. Is because like we have a lot of disadvantaged communities and the way Justice 40 works, it's not looking at race, it's looking at other variables. And because it's not targeting race in those racial panels, you're gonna see lack of improvement in terms of how we think about like race as a component of environmental justice, but we're going to help other neighborhoods maybe more. Okay. And like helping those neighborhoods, if we don't help the racially disadvantaged neighborhoods, the relative deprivation will increase. That's how I understood stand your graph. But. No, that is true. I think Ryan, we're trying to get into like why that is happening. Is it because we are targeting a certain, certain census tract, which has, which is considered disadvantaged, but has more, of a certain race than the other race. So, and is it the overlap of disadvantage versus PM 2.5 and they're not exactly, and race, and they're not all three the same thing? Does that make sense? Yeah, because I don't understand why if you emphasize having those changes take place um, in, in places that are already disadvantaged, why then you see this? Um, Not directly targeting race, as as Ryan said earlier, targeting an area. 
Oh, so the disparity that's being measured is a racial disparity? Correct, correct. Okay, so you're targeting something that doesn't have to do with race, and then you Measured. don't. Yeah. It, so you're not trying to achieve a racial difference, and then, in fact, you don't, or or something. Right. You're, not, you're not trying yes. to receive a yes, racial exactly. benefit. Mm -hmm. it, okay. Yeah, you're not... Well, you're that's must have yeah. measuring something else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so so we could. I think you want to get to your results. But we could go into a lot of detailed questions here, because then it really depends on their methodology of assuming who would have got those benefits mm -hmm. in the first place. Mm -hmm. and yeah, you have a good point about people people don't always apply or maybe the people that you would in quotes want to apply don't apply and there's structural barriers to that too mm -hmm. but you also have to be a little bit careful because i think people recognize that so like now i mean for the next right two months um i know epa has these uh technical assistance grants and they're setting up offices to help people apply because one of the mm -hmm. reasons they don't apply is that it's really complicated. Um, and so that's probably not included in the policy, right? So um, it's a little bit disingenuous for folks to say, well, we didn't target something and then we didn't achieve it, right? Mm -hmm. Correct, correct. So, yeah, anyway, I think, oh, yeah. Although yeah. I think the administration thought they had enough proxies that they could target race by targeting these other things. And like, that's the uh, argument yeah. they'd be making because like the Clinton era EJ executive orders say you have to think about race and like the Biden administration didn't want to get sued. So they didn't think about race. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then no surprise, you don't make any differences in race. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. It, it's fair. You try to do things indirectly and then you don't, that <laughs> you don't achieve what you secretly hope to achieve because you never told anybody. <laughs> and then everybody else learned to game the system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah, true. Okay. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's something I found very interesting. And okay, so what um what are we trying to do in this? Is yeah, we saw the opportunity of the lack of data at the household level that, tool didn't have so we are trying to leverage our fusion acs data set to look at both household level estimates and sort of compare those to track level estimates but the goal we we have here is yeah, trying to find if there are efficiency and equity trade-offs as we try to alleviate or look at this energy disadvantage question and how do we do that using you know heat pump subsidies and this forty percent um, threshold that we have? So the first question we had was well yeah how good is the space based targeting for energy particularly? So you are giving benefits to certain tracks based on the median, either on the mean or the median track behavior. So how well are you actually capturing the underlying? household level disadvantage so looking at the heterogeneity within a track and then the second question is well how do we then measure benefits arising from its electrification through heat pumps so who is going to get the investments or the subsidies what would be the emissions reductions once you switch out your appliance. So that is how benefits can be measured. That's one way of measuring benefits. And then we want to do this across different distribution scenarios. So one is we want to use the 40% cutoff and distribute 40, 60 across disadvantage and non-disadvantage. But we also want to look at other ways in which we can achieve this and what would be the trade-offs between Let's see our emissions reductions versus giving money to communities that are the most disadvantaged according to definitions. And then what if we tweak the definitions 
So those are all the different scenarios that we want to think about. And then we want to show well, what are the trade-offs and who's getting it, who's missing out, are there better ways to do this? Uh, and how good even is the 40%? Should that be higher, lower? So all those questions are what we are trying to answer with these different distribution scenarios. So next, what I'll do is we'll first talk about this idea of track level distribution versus household level distributions and to see how much is the tool missing or capturing if you look at these definitions differently. So as we saw the track level, it was about 90th percentile for energy burden and then there's an income cutoff as well. And what I did first was just apply the same method, but looking at the household distribution. So you have the national distribution for energy cost and the national income distribution. And I applied the same criteria to every single household. And I just compared the numbers to see, you know, what's going on. And I'll go through the numbers here, starting from the left. So you see this purple one, which is you take all the tracks that are considered disadvantaged by the tool and you add up uh, the number of people who will be captured by this just for energy. And it's about five to 6%. So the current tool says that about five to 6% of the national population would be considered as being energy disadvantaged. And I do the same, but for using the household definition, which is the one shown in red, and that one's slightly higher, so it's about maybe eight or nine percent. Even just same definition, but at the household level instead of the track level. So that's all. Arctic, yeah. Can you um does that number in the blue or the red? relate in any way to the um, what you were showing as like percent of states or US average overall for DAX, like the US average was 30% roughly, 30%. and then like Oklahoma, Mississippi were real high. Mm -hmm. Does this number in blue or red have a relationship to that? Like, is it a fraction of that? Or in, how, how can I think about those two things together? It, it is a fraction of that because the 30% was and all conditions. So there's about 15 or 20 different indicators. So for transport, for PM 2.5, there's a whole host of indicators and you would be considered if you met at, at least one of them. So the 6% is a fraction of that 30%. Um, is it, would, would we say five, of those 30% are dominated by their energy deprivation or is it just 5% of 30% or is it maybe not even quantitative? I think it's difficult to say directly because it's an R condition. So the 30- Oh, I see, okay. So it could be that, yeah, it, it could be anything. So it's difficult to say unless you actually looked up what was building up that 30%. It could be, yeah, anything could be contributing. For example, you could just be in a food desert and that's contributing the highest, like top of my yeah. head. I don't know what the contributions to that 30% are, but it's something that, yeah, you could do just looking at the tool itself, you could build up the numbers to 30%. But yeah, I don't okay. know. Okay, you know. I think I understand how at least the two relate, sort of, thank you. Okay, yeah. So the red one is using a household level definition of uh, disadvantage. And green one is sort of the overlap between the red and the purple in some sense. So what I do is you take the whole track and actually find who in that track meets this definition. So who are the most 
who's being captured within the track. And then that number is even lower, suggesting that energy disadvantage is not concentrated within the track as much. So you have households that are spread across the country and you're not really capturing the entire extent of disadvantage when you use this census track uh, level definition. And then finally, this is the EIA number using all the different measures that I've been talking about earlier. So if you're feeling cold, if you're feeling hot in the house, uh, if your equipment is broken, all of that is considered as energy insecurity or disadvantage by the EIA. And that number is close to 30%. So yeah, this is just sort of to lay down what the challenges or what the problem is with this tool and the way the tool is describing and measuring certain things. And now I'll go through the different scenarios that I had in mind to sort of get deeper into these numbers and find out what's going on and how, if we can do things differently. Okay, so I have five different scenarios for how we are thinking about distributing subsidies across these different DAC communities and measuring emissions reductions that will happen because of uh, the adoption. So we have a baseline scenario where we are looking at heat pump adoptions using a simple payback number. And this is without any subsidy. This is just to establish a baseline for who's most likely to adopt a heat pump if the payback time is less than six years. And I'm also using the new AHS data to sort of calibrate this and get a more valid payback time. And that is the payback time that I would be using for all the different scenarios. And for each scenario, what I'll be doing is tracking well, who's adopting in terms of income, race, and the household level disadvantage criteria and trying to see how many of them are in a DAG, what is the emission reductions across all these different cases. So that's the baseline case where we don't give any subsidies and just see what might happen. And so you're assuming, I mean, just because you know we've been fighting with decision rules, right? Mm-hmm. What is your decision rule? It's assuming that the payback time is less than six years. So that's how I have it. I have, that's how I have it right now. I what we want to do is we want to calibrate that to the new AHS to get a more defensible payback time. But yeah, what I have right now is yeah, six years. And how are you getting the payback time? So you have your current cost and your estimated future cost uh, and the savings. So if that is, if you can- And, and that's it. what you're using from Rex, is that right? Correct. And so you're you're assuming some of their packages or something? Mm -hmm. So from Rex, we have we, what your current packages as your heating system, heating fuel, and then, yeah, and then, you switch out your gas furnace to a heat pump, for example, and what are the savings you have, and then get to the payback time from that. But that that savings is what is what you're getting from Redstock, or how are you doing that? So you have your current, you have a future estimated cost from a heat pump. So this uh, numbers available from what your estimated cost is going to be in the future. So using your state level electricity prices, your uh, operating costs, your, uh, your purchase costs, your operating So is, is, costs. That, is that actually in RECs is what I'm saying? Uh, not everything, not everything. So the future cost is not in RECs. I think, uh, is that, I think that's in the Jewel paper, if I remember correctly. So, so that is, so it probably is from Redstock then. I think ultimately, yes. Yes, it is from Restock because that's what they use. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, because that has to 
there there's a lot in that right oh definitely we'll and, yeah so we i agree i i don't mind using it i just want to know where it comes from because it's not i'm pretty sure it's not ahs no it's not in any of these yeah it's an external thing that i bring into the data set so it's the I and I believe, and sorry, you might want to step in because of your knowledge of Redstock, but I believe what you must be using is they produce certain packages of like different stringencies. Mm -hmm. And so you must be using some output from that. Correct. So what they have is for different types of heat pumps. So one is for duct and ductless, they have different numbers. And uh -huh. different states, they have different efficiency numbers and different costs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sort of all, yeah, this is capturing all of that in, yeah. Yeah, but you're just using their numbers with that. You're, you're just believing what they say. Correct. Cool. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And yeah, the first case we have, first scenario we have is that of an, what we're calling an efficiency scenario where we give subsidies to ensure maximum emissions reduction. So we look at what are the potential savings in emissions coming from the switch. And then we are giving out subsidies so that we can maximize the amount of reductions possible, regardless of whether they are disadvantaged or not. This is just maximizing the emissions reduction benefits. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is that or is it do you mean efficiency like at the household level or is this based on the generation mix where that the household is getting their energy from well isn't that the same thing no because like i could have like electric heat and i put in a heat pump and i get a huge efficiency gain at the household level um but that would be different than saying like we're going to install heat pumps in areas where we have really green electric generation and so low co2 generation oh. versus fossil fuel burning i see so this is emissions reductions coming from this is coming from from the plant itself well hold on so the source of electricity is the same is this the household level emissions reduction so if you are getting doesn't matter where you're getting your electricity from if you're switching out a gas furnace to a heat pump, then that is just measuring how much CO2 you would have produced from burning that gas at the household level to, well, now zero. But you have to count the... So first of all, the emission is different than the efficiency, right? Mm-hmm. So there's the efficiency of using available energy and then there's the um the total CO2 emissions which mm -hmm. don't, I don't see how it doesn't depend on the local generation or where you're getting the electricity from. No, it it depends on where you're getting your electricity from. Yes. So that not stays the same. We're not accounting for We are only accounting for what changes at the household level. Yeah, but if you go from gas to heat pump, mm -hmm. then there's a huge change at the household level, right? right. But it goes, it goes to zero, but then mm -hmm. you're taking more electricity from somewhere else. Correct. So I guess, yeah, I didn't, yeah, that's not being accounted for right now, but I think that's something Uh, that should be easy to account for because we do have state level emission factors for different sources. So I should be able to add in that as well. So I think you're just using that so-called, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to differentiate between efficiency-based um motivations and and co and emission like co2 based motivations but mm -hmm. i think you're just using whatever motivation you are using mm -hmm. to determine how to distribute the um the changes right correct 
Correct. Mm -hmm. So you you wouldn't be getting it wrong. You wouldn't be getting the emission numbers wrong because you're just looking at the distribution, I believe. Correct. Yes. So you're right. Mm -hmm. But then if you're not, you might be getting the distribution wrong if you have an, a, a kind of a wacky assumption about what it means for emissions if you're not accounting for the state generation or the grid generation. Mm -hmm. I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, I think I should I should be able to add in that factor as well. So that's a good point. I didn't I didn't consider that. So okay. Remember, everybody, we have we're, we're we're getting close to time. We want to finish, but we have all next week because this always happens with Cartex work where we have a ton of questions. We can't dive into them. Um, so we have all next week to to um, to dr drill Kartik about his work. <laughs> OK, yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, somebody has? Oh, so, yeah. Go ahead. OK, yeah. And then that's the first scenario where we just want to decrease emissions. We give subsidies to those people, those households that are most likely to generate less once they have this money, and then we're going to track who they are, where they are, and how much the reduction is going to be. Uh, the second scenario is the other extreme in some sense that we give all the money to the, commun the DAC communities. So this is just to get the other extreme scenario. Mm and then we'll track again who's getting it how much is the reduction if you completely take a disadvantaged lens to this problem and then the third scenario is somewhere in between where we want to implement this 40 percent so we say okay 40 percent of the subsidies will go to the DAC 60 percent again goes to uh, the highest emitters outside and then okay, let's track everything again and the fourth one is uh, something that, again, the administration has prescribed, which is to do this equity weighting for the different households. So the underlying theory is that low-income households, a subsidy goes further in terms of being more valuable to them than if you were to give subsidies to a richer household and there is a weighting method for how you would want to weigh the low income households more than the high income households. And what we want to do is look at an equity scenario where you give out subsidies based on this weighting scheme so that everybody who deserves it the most because of this weight gets the subsidies. And then again, we're going to track all these criteria. And then finally, there's a fifth scenario, which is we forget the definition of the track and give it directly to households that have that meet this criteria at the household level. So meeting the energy disadvantage criteria, but now at the household level and again, track who's getting it, what race, where are they, are they in a DAC, are they not in a DAC, and what is the emission reductions. So across all these different scenarios, the goal is to see if there is a trade-off between how much emission reduction you can get versus who gets it and where they are and what their characteristics are. So that's it for today. So I just wanted to introduce these scenarios and yeah, get feedback for if, if there are different ways in which you can think about these scenarios or if I should modify these scenarios or just thoughts about how we can do this differently. Are you going to be distributing these without regard to state? Like you're just going to put them across the nation, regardless of what state people are in? Mm hmm Correct. Because then you probably have your hands full with all these scenarios, but that may be another interesting thing to look at, because I think there's already some distribution among the states. Because politically, you can't give everything to, like, even if all the poorest people were in one state, you couldn't give all the money to that state, right? 
that's true. But it's already, for example, if you if you look at Lai Heap, for example, a lot of the money is actually concentrated in the northern states. And there's a lot of discussion about how you should rethink how you're giving money to states because a lot of the southern states are facing the newer challenges with heat burden and all of that. So Yeah. Yeah, think, it's distributed by heating like by heating burden and not by cooling burden. Correct. So that might be an interesting thing to explore if you if if you kind of do a high level separation based on the current heat scale or weatherization formula. Mm -hmm. And and then you, you might even get from them like the some of the things they're considering to include the cooling burden in there and just try those two distributions. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah. I think, I think I just wanted to plant the question that Ryan also put in the text or the chat was, is this, when you talk about emissions, are you focused on CO2 emissions only? Yeah. Uh, it's CO2 equivalent. So when they give out the state level emission factors, they do include NO, NO2, and methane as well so in theory you could break them down but that's not getting in air pollution i think uh, it's interesting about the yeah i don't care as much about or I, I don't really care i just wanted to know i think you're just focused on climate impacting emissions not health impacting emissions i mean but if there's the... a include health impact i mean why not? I mean, the numbers that I have right now are just, yeah, CO2 emissions. But if there is a way to include them, if there's a database or something out there, I mean, I could definitely, you know, pull that in. It's it's not a big challenge to do that. Well, you had two, PM 2.5 concentration in it as one of the definitions for burden in the, your very first slide. Mm -hmm. And so there's apparently some thought that that would be included, but then you're not including it in your distribution. That's you, So first of all, you could make a hundred scenarios. We mm -hmm. could quickly come up with a hundred scenarios that you couldn't run, right? So we want to be really careful. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it's important to know that most of the health impact is not coming from things that count for global warming potential. Correct, correct. So yeah, I have not included PM 2.5 just because yeah. I'm not proficient in that, but yeah, it's it's not a thing that, yeah, I've not, yeah, I just don't know how to do it. I think that's the easiest answer. Mm -hmm. If there's a way you think we can include that somehow, I think can be done, but that's not something that I've, I've thought of. I I wasn't asking because I think you should expand what you do. I was um, just asking because I think if you're trying to commu communicate this to other people, when they hear the word emissions, they, mm -hmm. if they're a climate person, they w will think of what you're already doing. And if they're right. not, they might get confused. Like what, you know, so that's all. I, I yeah, I think what no, you're doing is great. No, that's really yeah. fair. Yeah, I didn't really consider that. I mean, that might be yeah, another way to define benefits as well as the initial example that I showed. They do measure PM 2.5 and reduction in P PM 2.5. So if there is a way that we could connect heat pump adoption to decrease, potential decrease in PM 2.5, then that would be another yeah, dimension to measure benefits which are not CO2. I think that's a really good idea, but yeah, let me think about how or if I could include that somehow. Yeah. Well, I think it's a pretty, it, it's a it's a fairly um, lengthy calculation string. 
like you can do it, but you'd want to be pretty careful about it. Mm. So I would be more likely to take existing PM 2.5 distributions and use them instead to set the distribution of benefit and then not worry about where the benefit occurred because going from where, where the electricity is used to where it's generated to what emissions come from that particular plant to where those emissions affect particulate matter is a long string that like probably only Chris Tessin knows how to do well, right? There's probably more people by now, but <laughs> there's there's a few people yeah. who do it well, and 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 I wouldn't try to do it without making those long connections. And so, just do what you can do well for mm -hmm. now. I I don't know what you think, Allison, because I know you've thought about this a lot. I don't think you should add it, Kartik, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> at all. I think you should just make clear when I you're see. talking about your scenarios that you are focused on these particular emission accounting data and leave it. Okay. I think anything that you try to do in a partial manner will not hold up. Right. And not because you can't, don't have the capacity um, or the competency to do it. Um, but I don't, I don't think it makes sense. I also would say, I'll go farther and say, I don't think it will matter. Like, I think mm -hmm. you will find, you know, the, Averted premature deaths will be on the order of one or two. There's a study that Shantanu Jathar and Cheryl Magsman did here on the shutdown of a coal-fired power plant. And it was like one premature death averted. I don't, I think <laughs> in terms of the distrib, and, and I don't like their methodology was something slightly different, but you're talking about the impacts of emissions somewhere else you have to attribute to keep the underlying comorbidities you won't be successful unless you devote a lot of work to like vetting that analysis and i don't think you need to to present strong work i think it's just a matter of definition on emission okay yeah that's a good suggestion yeah i think i'll, I'll do that thank you okay we're a little over um if you have questions that are left over write them down right now um and we've got it, Kartik, you may have a, maybe a couple of slides next time, but for the most part, we're going to let everybody just explore the ideas. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Um... Okay, thanks everyone. Have a good weekend. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Kartik. Bye. Thanks for listening.